but it was at an airport. I can't remember where. I, th- I think L.A. or Australia. And, um, you know, I was in a lounge thinking, I'm pretty, you know, it's pretty nice here. And then all of a sudden just driving by is the Foo Fighters' private jumbo jet with, like, <laughs> the, the two Fs. So I was like, okay, they do it well, too, you know. I'm Justin Jay, and this is The Plug. In the fall of 2001, five friends from New York City released their highly anticipated debut album, Is This It? Within months, the band had gone from playing in small downtown venues to becoming one of the most talked about new acts in the music industry. The album quickly became one of the most influential and celebrated debuts of the decade. Nearly 20 years later, The Strokes teamed up with acclaimed music producer Rick Rubin to record their sixth album. But once it was completed, the 2020 global pandemic forced the band to halt all touring and promotion for the project. The odds were stacked against them. It's rare for a band to release a truly original and critically acclaimed album so late in their career. But The Strokes did just that. In 2021, their album The New Abnormal won Best Rock Album and earned The Strokes their first Grammy. Today's guest is the bass player in this iconic New York City band. But how do you stay humble and avoid the pitfalls of fame when your band skyrockets from performing in East Village bars to being hailed as the saviors of New York rock almost overnight? We'll find out as we sit down for a chat with a member of the band that helped shape the musical identity of New York in the early 2000s and inspired countless imitators. Today, musician, surfer, and born and bred New Yorker, Mr. Nikolai Fratcher. Nikolai, thanks for sitting down, man. I know it's uh, it's a very rainy, dreary day here in Manhattan, so I appreciate you making the trek over here. Of course, thanks for having me. Um, so, what's what's going on this season? I mean, you guys getting ready to 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 go on tour or to record, or what? What have you been up to these days? Um, this season, um, I'm I'm kidding. I don't really see it as seasons, but. <laughs> Uh, these days, uh, we just played um, a show in Chicago for Keena Collins, um, and that was a lot of fun. Um, and now uh, we kind of, as the Strokes, we have some time off, um, so I'm just keeping busy. Um, I got a a call the other day, the other day from um, from Nick Zenner, who was uh, he's playing a show I think with uh, at the Bowery um, with Connor Oberst. Oh, that'd be um, fun. They, they needed a bassist, so I. I like Nick, so I said yes. Um, he's a cool guy, and the the band seems pretty pretty cool. I think uh, Connor Roberts is doing like a residency, and every Thursday he's got a new set of set of musicians to play. Oh, that sounds really interesting. I'm curious, like when you guys do a one off show, like what you did in Chicago, is that is that very different than when you go on tour? I mean, you got to like kind of shake some of the rust off. You, is it a smaller production in terms of like lights and stuff like that? Um, one-off shows are really the bane of every band's existence <laughs> because you basically have to do everything to get ready for a tour or a show, and then that's it. And uh, yeah, usually you're rusty. Um, it, it takes about, I think, a good week of playing together again where you feel that you're not really thinking about what you're playing anymore and you're just you're just performing you're just kind of you know on In stage yeah. um so yeah one offs are are not fun um but uh they, i mean they're not fun to prepare for but they they're fun to play but not to prepare and then they're just over before you know it and then that's it yeah yeah, yeah. a little bit like the show with uh that I'm doing with Connor and Nick it's yeah. uh it's yeah, I, the songs I don't know that well, and then I'm going to play them, and then I'll probably never play them again. So, <laughs> well, I wanted to take a very belated opportunity to to say congrats. Um, I know you guys won a Grammy for the Last Strokes album, The New Abnormal. It's been a while now, but um, you know I've been a fan of the band since the very beginning, and it's it's so rare for a band to put an album out that late in their career that sounds that fresh and that unique. It's that like critically acclaimed as well, you know, so it was really, it, it was, I think one of my favorite albums, but, you know, 
it was released right during the heat of the pandemic. And I know you had like your SNL show canceled. You had your entire tour canceled. Did that make winning the Grammy that much more meaningful? I mean, what was that experience like when you finally got it? Um, meaningful. It was very, very interesting <laughs> because, uh, you know, I think even the ceremony, there were certain uh, genres were invited to the ceremony. Other lesser popular genres were not. So we were basically in the country. I think it was Julian, me and Fab and... You know, we didn't know that we had won yet or not, and we were on video. We couldn't hear anything. The, the connection was terrible, and so it, it felt like really disconnected. It didn't feel like the the big Grammy party where you know it's like you were partying with Drake and Taylor and no, uh, all the, and the one names. Yeah. No, we didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we didn't. Uh, we didn't get those after party invites. Um, so yeah, is it in LA? I don't even know. I think it's. I think I mean it. It toggles back and back and forth, but it has. I think it's been in LA for the last it's couple been of in years. LA, yeah, so we were on the East Coast uh, in a weird bunker. Uh, <laughs> and where does each each member gets their own statue? You have one in your house. I do. Yeah, in my in my closet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have the. I don't know. I can't. That's something I feel strange putting on my shelf. It's funny. I mean, I remember <laughs> I, I asked Nick about that too. And I was like, is that something you kind of have checkered feelings about? Because, you know, like, I don't know, coming from, I grew up, you know, in punk rock culture, that's like the most uncool thing you could do. But like, at some <laughs> point you're just like, no, man, I, I have a goddamn Grammy. I think that's pretty, I think it's pretty special, you know? Like, yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have, I don't have like so many feelings about that. I just, it's really cool that we got recognized. I mean, I know there's a lot of controversy with it as well. So, you know, where I'm, I'm not going to complain, yeah. but I don't, you know, parade around with it. And, you don't like rest your laurels on it. No. Yeah. I like you might rest your t-shirts on it instead. <laughs> t-shirts. It's in a box. It's safe. It's clean. It's in a box, you know, but it's, uh, it's my son's like, why don't you put that on the shelf? And yeah. I don't know. I don't. Um, well, you know, you worked with Rick Rubin on the album as a producer, and uh, I, I want to talk about him for a second because he seems like a very curious character. Like, well, if, did you have a chance to read his book that just came out? I did, yeah. What did you, you think about it? I thought, what I thought was really, it felt like just being in the room with him uh, recording, uh, just kind of all the things that he says were flashing back, and that, that, that part I thought was cool. It's hard to to judge the book because I, we worked with him and it's, yeah. uh, but it's very much similar, similar stuff. I just, I, it wasn't at all what I expected. It took a minute for me to kind of adjust to it. Cause I don't know if you had a chance to watch the, the Hulu special with Paul McCartney that he did. Um, mm. That was fascinating. Cause they just, they played like isolated tracks and stems and talked about, you know, how the songs were composed and the inspiration. And, oh, yeah, I and I really thing. thought that it would be much more kind of studio tales. And the book really turned out to be a, almost like a kind of philosophical thesis on the the creative process, you know? Yeah. And I'm wondering, is, is that really on brand for how he operated as a producer? Because it, it seemed like, you know, the Strokes put so much energy to creating a really unique sonic sound, what, however that may be defined. And I, as as somebody, you know, Rick Rubin is like a professed non-musician who doesn't play any instruments. I can't imagine him obsessing over mic placement or or, or vocal effects. But I almost, I, I pictured him giving you these kind of like abstract, ethereal like questions and 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 philo and being almost more like a guru. Is that is that a fair statement? I think that's uh, partly fair. Um, I think that he he definitely, you know, his vision of us. For these uh, recordings being in, we we recorded in. Um, oh, actually, are we talking about the the new up normal? Right? Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, like that actually, I, I I'm moving on to the because we recorded new music with him as well. Oh no way! So you have yeah. new stuff coming out. Of, Hopefully, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, we we definitely recorded a, a full more than a full album's worth of stuff um, with him. So that's I was. Looking through my memory, so bank. the process yeah. worked. You're you're happy with with, um, with well, with the that, that's kind of um, yeah. The uh, the new abnormal we recorded in Malibu in his uh, in his studio at um, uh, Shangri La. Shangri La, yeah, and, and that place was awesome. It was right by the beach, um, and it was really cool to. It's kind of like a new setting. We, we it doesn't feel so much like a a big studio. He kind of makes it feel a lot less a lot less. Uh, 
how how important is the the physical context of recording? Like, does the does the vibe of a studio like really have a profound effect on on, on the final product? I mean, it's an element, but is it really is it that important? I think it's probably after the musicianship and the you know the band. It's probably the most important part of it. Um, it really really has an effect on how you feel. Um, the vibe you're getting that day. Um, for me, that's really important. Um, what the what the feeling is when you're recording. Um, you know, you can ha- for us and for me, it doesn't ever really work in this. You know, really cold AC giant studios. We tried, and you know, it just doesn't feel. I mean, your roots come from like a basement, basically, right? I mean, pretty much, like, yeah. yeah, basement in yeah in New York. Um, so when you yeah, every, anytime we try like a a big studio and it, you can hear it. I mean, the, the things we would do are so flat. I guess you can't hear it because we never released it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it would, it would feel flat and cold, like the AC in the room and just kind of, you know, not a good, not a, a comfortable feeling. Um, and as we were young and you're insecure and it's just, you know, you doesn't feel uh, conducive to making something fun. And, and how is his like technical approach different as a producer than you had with like with with Gordon or Gus or some of the producers you've worked in the past? Um, he Rick is, I would say, I mean, he says he he doesn't know a lot, but you know, he does, and you know, I'd, he'd be fiddling with the uh, with the uh, the drum machine. I, I mean, one one time I remember coming in and he was really paying attention to the to the to the toms, like how they how they were sounding much more than I anticipated him to be so maybe so about. maybe he he actually undersells his his knowledge of the Probably technical aspects bit. of I it. I don't want to yeah. reveal any secrets <laughs> but you know he's uh yeah he's he's a smart guy and he's he really knows he knows what he's doing in terms of the I think the engineering aspect as well he just he has other people help him but um yeah. I feel like he, yeah, he knows where things fit and how, how to sound good. Can you give like an interesting example of something that he might have asked you or asked the band to do that seemed kind of just bizarre or abstract at the time, but really had like a, a profound effect on the final product of the album? Um, I think the main thing for us, for both uh, albums, the, the new Normal and the new one, um, is jamming. And we never, ever really did that Um since the early days. So like on As I Said, we did a lot of jamming and we were always playing music. We were always hanging out. And then over time, you know, life happens and you just don't have those that that time or those those moments anymore. And so I think what he really captured well was um, just getting us in a room. And for the first uh, one with for the new abnormal, it was he would say one hour every day before I come in, I want you guys just to jam, just, you know, all five of you, not just a couple of you, just everybody, the five of you just let loose um, for an hour and then we'll work on music and then listen to the, what we did in the morning later to see if there's anything worth keeping. And then the next day we would work on that stuff. So it became kind of like a, a domino kind of train effect where... That's so yeah. That, well, that's so cool because it seems like in one in one sense it seems like it it should be so obvious because I mean if there's one thing that you guys have always been is it's a band. I mean if anyone who's seen you guys live, it's like you can appreciate the the chemistry and the musicianship. And so it seems it it seems strange that you kind of somehow slowly drifted away from that creative process. You know. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, people move to L.A. and things yeah. happen, so you, you can't really get that. So I guess he c- concentrated it into a month or a couple of weeks at a time. And so we were able to do that, sort of rekindle that um, in, in that setting. And and what's what's the power dynamic of a music producer, especially somebody like Rick Rubin, who comes with such a, an esteemed track record? I mean, let's say if the strokes are a democracy, is he the president or is it more you guys are actors and he's the director? Is he an employee of the band? I mean, how, how are creative conflicts resolved? I guess is what I'm getting at. Um, I think that what was great about the sessions, it was this feeling was just try anything, try everything. And then, you know, it was not like, Oh, I don't want to do that. You know, Oh, I don't like that idea, but, and I don't want to do it. It was, I'm not sure about that idea, but I'll try it. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And I think overall, by the end, you know, we would obviously have our differences, but 
it was we we kind of all it was a feeling and what was great about his method of working is that he was looking for these moments and you know somebody might have not played as well that was kind of his his advice sometimes you messed up but unless you can beat that and feeling um, I'm not going to change it. I'm just going to keep that. So even if your performance, you feel that you could have done better, the overall feeling worked better on that track and you could try to overdub it. But if you don't beat that feeling that you got when you made it, then it was not worth keeping. Um, so it sounds like you guys, there was a lot of trust involved. You guys really like respected and, and kind of just gave him a long leash to to kind of direct you. And then after the fact, after you tried all these things, were you generally on the same page of whether it quote unquote worked or didn't? Um, yeah, once we got on the same page, there were obviously some songs that, you know, we we had worked on that we liked and he was just kind of, you know, automatic bin song. And I was like, oh, you know, come on, give it a chance. And there was yeah. other things that he really liked and we felt maybe it was a little too polished for us. Um, but I think by the end, we, we, we kind of got to a place where we... We both like the, the end result. So, I mean, one thing that I've always found so fascinating that I learned about the Strokes early on is that when you guys first formed the band, that none of the members had ever been in any other band before. Like the Strokes were the first band that you guys were all in, which I think is such a, such a cool concept. But, you know, as a photographer, sometimes I'm involved in a collaborative process, but ultimately, like, I'm the one pushing the, the shutter or I'm the one composing the shot or I'm the one directing the subject. And so this kind of sense of camaraderie or brotherhood that a band must experience when they're together like that is in some ways like a foreign concept to me. Like not even just the creation process, but you guys, you travel the world and you share a stage and you share a bus and you, you share know, have to, <laughs> and you have to rely on each other a lot every, every night when you're on tour. Do you think the fact that you guys all started at the same inception point has kept you guys from imploding as a band in a way that a lot of others have? I mean, do you think that that's a defining factor in the Strokes that this is your first and only band or your first your first experience of being in this band? Um, what a defining factor as of our band? Yeah. Um, I don't know if it defines our band, but I think that I mean, not it, a sole factor. But do you think it's like do you think it's a contributing factor to like why you guys have been able to just maintain the chemistry and not disintegrate like a lot of other bands have? I think definitely the history there is kind of something that's um, you know very hard, if not impossible, to walk away from. You know, when you've been together for that long, it's kind of you, unless there's a really, really good reason, unless it's the creativity is just done or something happened that's, you know, um, uh, unforgivable or irrevocable or, you know, uh, it's kind of, I don't know. It's, um, it's yeah, it's just something that, uh, that I get. It's kind of like, um, yeah, the com you have a commitment and an investment to each other that, you know, like with Fab, there's, something in the playing that um that's just uh you can't you can't just make that in a in a session you know for three weeks rehearsing with a bunch of guys it's something that's been over 20 years we lock in in a way that's just you know automatic when we get together it's just we go right back into that so yeah i think it's um it's just something that uh that it's it's yeah i, I wouldn't say I would I would walk away from something that special that comes along so so rarely in your life in in the decades in music and just in general it's um yeah I mean I think that's why I'm always so excited to hear what you guys come up with because there's some bands and there might even bands that I really like but you get the sense that you've kind of heard every song that they're ever gonna make you know yeah and. And you guys always do something different. And especially in that last album, I was like, this is, I have never, I've never heard this from you guys before, you know, and I'm excited for the next one too. So, oh, cool. Um, you know, another thing that is really interesting is that, you know, every member of the band at some point has either put out their own solo project or a solo album or done a side project, but you guys always come back together as the Strokes. And, you know, I've, I went on tour with Albert for his solo project and shot some photos. I shot the publicity package for your solo project. Big fans of them both. And as much as it sounds like a cliche, I, I really think there is something about the chemistry that makes the sum of the parts, you know, greater, the, the, the whole greater than the sum of the parts, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, 
Is there a sense that the band feels the same way? Is that why you guys always kind of gravitate back to each other at some point and record us the strokes? It's not something that's kind of talked about. I mean, personally, I agree. I think that, you know, like I said, there's certain things that come along once in a while and the, all the pieces just kind of fall into the right place with hard work and, of course, um, you know, um, dedication and focus. But there's just something that, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that um, it's not, we don't talk about it and say like, oh, this is, you know, our whole, our, our sum is greater than the parts. Yeah, you know, no, I mean, it's, I, album, I, I you know? wish there was a better way to phrase it because it's, it's corny, but I mean, I, it, it, there is a sense of when you listen to your solo projects and it's just like, oh, that's, that's, that's a particular strength that I hear as a whole in the right. album, whether it's like, you know, Julian's sense of melody or like Albert's rhythm or, you know, you that the kind of just backbone like rhythms that you create on the bass like you really you really get a sense of like why everything works so good together when you hear it separately if that makes right. sense yeah i mean i you know it's funny i don't see i feel like what we do as a band is so so different than what we each do separately so i feel like when we get together you know my head is not anywhere else except for us in the room playing together um so i'm not aware or conscious really of of what that element is but i do think that yeah when once it's the five of us there's just something that is that just happens that you know we're we're all really um excited to play the music to be together um at least on my i'll speak for myself yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, so it's something, yeah, I, I, it's not something I think if you could explain it, then a lot of other people would do it. Well, talk to me about the difference between, you know, being a supporting member on The Strokes versus being a, a front man for your own solo project. I mean, is that complete freedom something that you find refreshing or is it very intimidating or a little bit of both? Um, it's, yeah, I mean, in the band you have like the, you know, you have partners that are there together so it's it's a lot easier to you know for all of us when we get together anywhere in a studio or on tour you know you know you have something someone there it's not gonna it's not just you out there and you know everything kind of uh falls back on 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 your decisions um but having said that you know things that i do are they're just fun I, i'm not out to conquer the world you know it's just projects i love to play with other musicians um and learn from them and and just create other different vibes but you know it's i'm realistic in the sense that you know what we created 20 years ago you know i don't have those 20 years to, to start over again yeah. so in the studio is it a very different experience like creating something as a solo artist as opposed to having for other people kind of giving their input on, I like that, I don't like that, go this direction, let's try this, and just having that complete freedom to be like, this is what I want to do? Um, less, you know, for me, the studio is, um, I, I work at home a lot. I have like a little spot in my in my apartment, um, very little spot, <laughs> uh, as opposed to a bigger studio. But um, yeah, that's where I do most of writing and, and kind of playing, and then I'll, get together with other musicians. Um, that part is also a creative part. I love the input of other musicians. I, I think you can kind of hear when, you know, you want too much of your sound on, on something. I think even in even in the strokes, like when you're, when someone is too fixated on something that has to stay, uh, it kind of, you can hear that it sounds very linear and very kind of um, flat sometimes. Um, so for me, I, I love the input of, you know, of any other musician um, on what I'm doing, like in Summer Moon. Um, you know, they're all really amazing, talented musicians and come up with cool stuff. And I'm not going to be like, no, that's that's not mine. So I don't like it. You know, it's, <laughs> well, do you do you appreciate the the creative process in the studio as much as you do performing and touring? Like if you could do one without the other, if you could just be like Pink Floyd or Steely Dan or a band that just like puts out music and doesn't really have much of a presence on tour, is that something that, that you would like to do? Or do you really have a love of the, the process of performing in front of people? I used to think that that's what I wanted was just to 
be, you know, a band that plays music and stays home and does their studio stuff. But I think that I really enjoy touring, traveling, um, playing. The touring is not so so creative. You know, we're just playing stuff that we rehearsed and we're just replaying it. You know, the, yes, there's subtle differences and each city is different, each venue is different, but overall it's, uh, you know, it's more creative at home or in the studio or, you know, writing music. But uh, But I do like the balance of being able to, to, you know, I get stir crazy at home. I get uh, cabin fever yeah. on tour. So it's just kind of like, you know. Like a yin and yang. There's yeah, a, having a good balance. I mean, because, I mean, obviously the the logistics of touring can get arduous, I would assume, at some point. Probably very fun at some, at the beginning of yeah. your career. And then maybe if you're married or you're sober or you're just not in that headspace anymore, <laughs> it could be like, it can be arduous. That said, there's there's something about the fact that there's, just a very small amount of people on earth that can experience, let's say, 20,000 people singing a song that you and your friends wrote in a room. Like that experience must just be like fantastic. I mean, can you even give an analogy of what that's like? Um, I don't think there's an analogy uh, for me. I think it's, it's, it is the thing. It's, a, it's amazing to, to be able to play, to to be, especially after 20 years, to be able to write new music that people are singing in the same way and not, you know, singing just the old song. Actually, when we released The New Abnormal, it was kind of weird to see that the kids knew this, the newer songs better than the older ones, wow. um, which was a bit of a trip for, for me, at least, on stage. Um, but, yeah, I think, um, I think, uh, yeah, I... I to me, it's, uh, I don't know how to, again. It must be something. special. I mean, but then I guess in, in the sense, how do you keep it, how do you keep it fresh each night in the sense that, I mean, I don't know, can, can, can Mick Jagger play Satisfaction one more time and, and have it actually still have any emotion to it? You know I mean? It, it, how do you stay away from the curse of having to, you know, quote unquote, play the hits every time you go on tour? Well, we're lucky that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or on uh, either way we, that we don't tour very much yeah. uh, anyway so um you know like like we were talking about earlier the one offs um the one offs keep it keep it exciting keep us nervous cuz you know we it's you're kind of playing like your first show each time um so that that keeps it um keeps it a little bit exciting um yeah we don't the touring doesn't get you know uh, you're not doing like a 400 date worldwide tour that just that's it's not, not our style. style. <laughs> I don't know if it's not our style or we just can't get it together. Yeah. <laughs> if we're just I don't know exactly what it is, but yeah, we we never really did that kind of um, all out year tour, and I think we did it once uh, on Is It in the early days, and we I think we we got fried, and and it was after that we. Uh, I think it was just not 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 for us. What's the what are the differences of of playing like a big solo tour show versus like a festival? Is one is that more of a party atmosphere? Is it a little lighter, or is it more of kind of a pain in the ass because it's like closer to a one off show and you're competing for stage space and in grip equipment or whatever with with a bunch of other bands? Um, I mean, the only difference is your your backline and your stage setup is is maybe not what you're used to. Um, the one um, when you play like a festival, um, festivals are also one-offs and or a couple in a string of you know a few summer shows and one in June and one in you know late July, but they're fun. You know you get to meet a lot of cool bands. Um, we got to see uh, Amel and Sniffers uh, last summer. That was you know it's just cool to see bands that you normally w wouldn't kind of see uh, just in New York or you know I don't really. Yeah, I'm not like I used to when I was younger, going out to find shows, and yeah. so for me, that's kind of my, like my year. <laughs> all my <laughs> year shows, I cram it all in in one uh, in one show. That's funny. So you know, the last time that we were hanging out, you told me like a really cool story. You were talking about recording the Strokes' first album, and you had just finished a session, and you went to get some drinks at this bar Two Way in the East Village, and you had the bartender put on. Uh, a mix of a song that you'd just been working on. I think maybe it was um, 
barely, barely legal. Barely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably less. Um, maybe it's barely legal. Um, but a few minutes later, somebody came up and was just like, hey, what's this song? This is really cool. You know, and I'm, I'm botching the details of the story. But the, the point is, is that you, you told this story with, with such a, a sense of fondness. And it really, I, I really got a sense that, that that memory really meant something to you. And, you know, becoming successful and achieving fame can sometimes be such a, a transformative experience that it seems like a lot of people lose perspective of what it felt like to be unknown and to be struggling and to be having that experience of somebody appreciating what you do for the first time. And it seems like you really have a firm grasp of that and you still hold on to that. And, you know, that said, the the Strokes had a relatively fast track path to success when you first started. That first album drops, you guys are pretty much the toast of the town, you're famous, the album's doing well. But that said, it wasn't that long before that that you were just five guys recording in a basement or whatever. What was it like for you at that time, like straddling those two really distinct realities at the same time? I mean, how did you handle that? Um, I don't think I handled it very well. <laughs> um, I think uh, in hindsight, I think at the time I thought this is cool. I got this, and it's all it's all fun. But I think um, yeah, in hindsight, there's probably a lot of things going on mentally that I wasn't really aware of, and you know. But at the right before then, while we were recording and while we were working on the music, that that was kind of the. Uh, you know, the really fun time is really no expectation, just working on music, trying to get an album finished, you know, before you had record labels, you had albums. So there, there was a goal, there was a focus. Um, and that was really the fun part of it. And and then kind of once you're done hanging out and just meeting up with friends, other seeing other bands, you know, just really getting involved in that. Um, but after that, I think things, yeah, just inevitably got weird and I don't know I, I thought I handled it better than I actually did <laughs> <laughs> I mean do you think does that speak to just the innate nature of of kind of sudden fame and success is it is it is it youth I mean it's just some people not many people but some people handle it better than others like is 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 there any tools that you would have wished that you would have had to maybe handle it a little bit better um, it's, you know, it's such an unnatural state that I don't even know, I don't, I don't even know what advice I would give to anyone, yeah. um, going through that transition. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It was just a, you don't really, you're not conscious. You, you don't realize that, you know, things are changing, but you're still trying to hold on to this thing that, you know, meant so much. And then it, it kind of, it, it takes on a new form. Um, so adapting to trying to adapt to every new thing that's happening so fast for me took a little bit of time. And what do you think would, would could you define some of the, the biggest like things that, that you found yourself changing? Is it, is it a strain on relationships? Is it a strain on like on, on kind of self-perception? I'm like, what, how would you define that experience of, of kind of becoming famous, I guess, is the, you know, to put it bluntly. I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't think I'm, we were not like, you know, crazy, crazy famous, but the little bit that we got. In in um, your own world, in New York City, yeah. you, you guys were famous. Let's, let's be Yeah, honest. exactly. Yeah. Well, that's a good way to put it, because in our own world, in our in New York City, sure, you know, in the greater world, and the, you know, at the end of the day, we're a band, we play music, it's, it's fun. Um, but, uh, but in terms of, yeah, I, I think in terms of how people uh, reacted to it was more of a strange thing for me of not so much how I was reacting to it. It was just how other people around were were reacting to the... Uh, treat you differently. Yeah, good and bad, you know, both all, all types. Uh, so it was just weird to see certain people change or maybe I changed or we changed and we didn't realize or, you know, it was all these kind of you know, energy reactions that were just trying to figure out and being in your, you know, in, in your early 20s, sort of very, um, very naive and, you know, and trying to make sense of all of that was yeah. kind of, you know, weird. Well, I mean, on that on that same topic of fame, I, I was having lunch with Albert from, from the band uh, several years ago, and we were at the Bowery Hotel. 
And it was a beautiful day. We're sitting outside and the waitress came by with this like fruit salad and it was nothing special, but it looked delicious. And so when it came time to order, Albert's like, oh, just, can I get the fruit salad? And, and the waitress kind of turned to us like kind of apologetic, but also a little bit like condescending. She's like, oh, the chef actually made that special for a celebrity that's actually not available. And it was like <laughs> the weirdest moment. And, and I looked yeah. at Albert. And I could see him doing the calculations in his head. He was like, do I really have to fucking be that guy? He'd be like, do you know who I am? You know. <laughs> and of course he didn't because he's not a douchebag and he's a cool, humble dude. But I mean, it just, I was so shocked at how explicitly she stated it, you know, and it really speaks to this kind of this intersection of, of, of fame and, and the currency that it has. Yeah. It's like kind of the ultimate currency in some ways in, in our culture. And I'm wondering, do, do you have any interesting stories that are kind of similar to that to speak to the politics of fame and, and access and, and maybe the way it's corrupted somebody or the way that somebody has gotten something that they shouldn't have that you've gotten to witness? Um, I mean, I, I, I can't think of anything specific. Um, I'm sure that I, you know, benefited greatly from a lot of those things, uh, whether it's a waitress at the Bowery who can recognize you or not. I mean, there's definitely, you know, times where, um, you know, where, yeah, it's uh, it's been... You might get a table when you wouldn't have otherwise or whatever. Yeah, I mean, that stuff, I that's like um, other... Yeah, I don't do that. <laughs> I don't tell of and you know... <laughs> But uh, but yeah, I'm sure through I'm sure in the ways that I don't even realize because we have people around us and I'm you know I feel like things are so easy you know I, I actually a good uh, an example I can think of is traveling when I travel on my own <laughs> it's like where's my tour manager like I you know how do you book a flight like I, do I have my passport and you know they usually everything's taken care of yeah so I think probably I don't even realize where I'll just say. To somebody like oh I really wish I could have that you know and then all of a sudden you have 10 of them and it's like I only asked for one you know? yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah so I'm sure it, it happens and I'm not aware you know, it's funny I, we I mean, had a similar conversation with um, Chris Shiflett from the Foo Fighters and you know he's been traveling doing his own solo projects as well I mean and the Foo Fighters are just such this behemoth touring machine, yeah, you know, and then talking crazy. about the difference traveling as a solo artist. Yeah. He's like literally carrying his own amp into the, into, yeah. the, into the show, you know. Into the club. And yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's it's very different, you know. Actually, uh, it's funny, the Foo Fighters, I was at an airport, I can't remember where, I, I think LA or Australia, and, um, you know, I was in the lounge thinking, I'm pretty, you know, it's pretty nice here, and then all of a sudden, just dr uh, driving by is the Foo Fighters' private jumbo jet with like the, <laughs> the two Fs. So I'm like, okay, they they do it well too, you know. <laughs> hey, all right, I'll go have my warm peanuts and just call it a day. <laughs> um, it, was there anyone that you got to meet that you were really excited to that you were disappointed in, or somebody that you were kind of awestruck that you did get to meet as a result of you know being in in the band? I mean. I'm mean, yeah. sure you've met everybody, but like, is there somebody that kind of sticks out as like the worst and the best? Um, I mean, there, I've been really, you know, um, lucky to have met a lot of people that I wanted to as a kid. Um, definitely, you know, the the trifecta of like Lou Reed, Iggy Pop, David Bowie. Wow. That was kind of a the holy trinity, I guess. Um, and. They were all really cool. Luckily, um, Iggy Pop was really, really cool. David Bowie is awesome. And so was Lou Reed. We got to play with Lou Reed. Um, got to play Walk on the Wild Side with Lou Reed, which wow, is pretty... Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, that was fun. Um, the bad ones, I forget. I just yeah. I don't think about them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, uh, you know, so I started this this podcast around around the same time when I released my book, HI1K. It's like a, a chronicle of, of 10 seasons of surf culture on the North Shore of Hawaii. And so, you know, there's a lot of surf DNA in this podcast, but I've also had on a lot of musicians that I've got to work with or I'm friends with. And, you know, coincidentally or not, a lot of them have kind of found a passion for surfing, whether it's Andrew from MGMT or Chris from the Foos, um, you know, Albert started surfing as well. Um, and I was just so thrilled that you and I got to go and have a surf session out in Rockaway this winter. And I just, I'm curious about what your your backstory of surfing is. How did you get into it? Um, how did I get into it? I think on tour, randomly in places, probably in Hawaii, the first time we went 20 years ago, there was a board somewhere and 
I kind of started. I always, from New York, always wanted to surf. It was like so frustrating that I lived on the East Coast and, yeah. you know, couldn't, uh, didn't have as many opportunities. So really, I think on tour and eventually, I, uh, I know, um, you know, Greg from um, from with the Devendra. With Devendra, yeah, yeah, he took me in LA. Um, you know, just more people started. I started taking me out to to the beach to. To surf. Um, were you surfing when you were recording New Abnormal? Were you staying in Malibu? Or? Um, I was at the time uh, staying there, but I was not surfing at the time. I, I, it was kind of just like work, Focus. work. Yeah, more focused. I, I yeah, I regret um, not being able to do that. But yeah. I, I mean, it's funny because I guess for, for anyone who's ever maybe only surfed in Hawaii or California or, you know, Rincon, Malibu, like some of the kind of marquee spots to come and Surf at Rockaway is a very different experience, you know, and it was really fun getting to to take you out there and kind of see it through fresh eyes. So what were some of your biggest takeaways from from Rockaway? Had you spent much time out there before? Uh, never, actually. Um, I loved it. You know, it's kind of more old school New York, which I was born and raised here. So I feel like it, you connect to your roots a little bit. It reminds me of what New York felt like when I was younger. Um, and so, yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, I think everyone who takes me out surfing, yeah, I have like a cosmic debt of gratitude too. <laughs> well, it's good. And it, it goes both ways too. Cause like, I know, I know a lot of surfers, I've shot a lot of surfers, like, you know, everybody from beginners to pro and it's like, I often feel like the most jaded surfers are the ones that are really good. And mm -hmm. usually you take somebody out, whether they're, you know, for their very first time or kind of beginning or inter intermediate, and like, they always have a smile on their face, you know, and it's yeah. the, the surfers that are really good. They're like, oh, the tide wasn't quite right, or it's a little yeah. fat, or, you know, and it's like, and you get so jaded. So it's really fun getting to kind of take new people out, and especially to a new place like Rockaway, which is just so completely unique. You know? Yeah, it's definitely cool. Yeah, I don't... Um, I'm curious the day if it ever happens that I get jaded because <laughs> I don't think it's I don't see that. Um, so, I mean, is there is there one stroke song that you kind of look to that that either you're most proud of or that kind of just encapsulates like what the spirit of the band really is? You're like, oh, this this song, if I had to choose one song, this is kind of like this is what our mission statement is all about. This is what we really tried to create. Mm, I don't think there's too hard. It's not that it's too hard. I don't think we have like, uh, you know, we change so much and we're so different and we're individuals who get together as a as a unit. Um, so I don't think there's there's never, you know, if, if we had that, I think our albums would have be boring by now. Um, that comes back to what I said before about like a band that you feel like you've you've heard every song they're ever going to make before and you guys are not that band. Well, thanks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, there's a few bands that, I, you know, that I can think of or maybe one or two that, you know, you kind of follow the journey of the band. You're, you know, it doesn't happen as much anymore because, you know, there aren't albums as much and, you know, the record labels aren't as um, as prevalent. But, you know, when we were young, when I was young, I would, you know, follow the journey of the band. So they, this is what they did in, in, at that, in that era. And then they evolved to that. And now they're doing this. And that part I didn't like so much, but now they're, it's crazy. And, yeah. you know. So. I feel that way about the the Arctic Monkeys, which ironically, I think the first time I ever saw those guys was with you when we were in Sweden. We went oh, to wow. their show. <laughs> um, and they've had quite a journey as well. And yeah. um, it's funny, their their latest album, I got it for my birthday last year. And my mom was visiting and she's like, oh, this is really nice. What is oh, this? Oh, <laughs> gosh. I was like, I don't think you'd appreciate their <laughs> earlier stuff as yeah. much. You know, they've changed quite a bit. I don't know if... if your music gets to a place where your mom is saying, I don't think I like this. It's like, oh, I'm not sure if we're... Uh, <laughs> I'm joking. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so mm. I've, I've shot I've shot with enough bands and, and, and taken pictures kind of candidly backstage to to know that if, if a band has a really bad set, that the vibe backstage can be really dour and really, really toxic. And, you know, I think the irony of, of something like that is that I think the difference between the best and the worst set on tour is not necessarily something that fans might even notice, you know, and, and me personally, if a band does, you know, a false start or a mistake, or they're like slightly loose and sloppy, like I almost kind of appreciate that. Cause it's just, it feels, it feels real and it feels unique and it's not a Broadway play. It's, it's, it's a rock show, you yeah. know, but something tells me, 
you guys don't feel that way. <laughs> and, and I'm wondering, like, what what are some of the things that could happen during a show that would really derail the vibe backstage after the show? I think we've become a lot more relaxed in the later years. But um, yeah, I mean, often it's a technical thing where, you know, the the crowd can't see what's happening on stage. But, you know, you you need to be able to hear yourself and to be able to play well and you know when you're in a big room with giant speakers and you're just kind of lost in this muddy mix of you know craziness i think that's probably the worst thing for for musicians um, that are performing um, is just to not be able to hear yourself or some kind of technical issue obviously there's the cliche of the musician getting mad at his engineer or whatever yeah. you know technician well, but um, what about musicians getting mad at the musician that you guys do you, are you very hard on each other if you make mistakes during a show or I think harder on yourselves? In the earlier days, we were harder on ourselves and on each other a little bit. But I think um, I think now, I don't know, I feel like we, we know what we have to do to perform. And Pretty well-tuned machine. Yeah, if you miss a little note, I mean, you know, I can hear it, but I'm, yeah, I know the crowd can't hear something that I did or something that someone else did. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's always that, like, you know, uh, annoying guy online. It's like, oh, he missed that note on there, you know, like, <laughs> like that one dude, you know. But uh, but overall, people are there to have fun, and I agree with you. I don't, I don't really go to shows to see, uh, you know, to test the musicians' uh, performance ability. It's more like a vibe and yeah, um, a feeling. But then you hear stories of, you know, like James Brown used to famously like dock the pay of his musicians if they dropped the lemon, you know, like. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's, he had a different, you know, he was this, the front man yeah. in the James Brown show and you have hired musicians, you know, us, it's a little bit different where it's kind of, we're just there together. And, you know, I think, uh, as you say, um, a lot of a lot of, including myself, I, fans and people don't want to see a show that's just pristine and, you know, tracked over sometimes. And, you know, I can put on my, my play the album. Yeah, yeah. You play the album and you want a little bit of, um, I guess, danger, a little bit of fun, a little bit of something. That's why you went out. That's why you go out. You know? Yeah. Well, we always like to, to end the podcast by, by asking the guests to plug something that they're not directly involved in, but they feel isn't getting enough attention, whether that's like a book or a movie, uh, an artist, a social cause. Is there anything that you're like feeling lately that you just want to give a extra shine to right now? Um, I wish you had prepared me for that because I have no idea. <laughs> we'll put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. What are you watching these days? Anything interesting? Watching, not watching a lot um, recently. Um, uh, what am we'll I? Tighten, we can tighten this up. Oh, I know. I, I, I just read a book uh, from um, Lucy Sante called um, I Heard Her Call My Name. Um, and Lucy Sante um, transitioned. Uh, she was an, a writer. She is a writer. Um, and she wrote um, this book that I loved about New York City called Low Life. Um, oh, uh, oh, it's Luke. It used to be Luke Sante. Luke Sante, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So um, it's a book all about how she, how she, how she kind of came to see that she was always a woman, and um, it was really interesting because the all of her writing in the past was from a very different perspective, and it's very gritty. I would say. I mean. Uh, it seemed like a very masculine, gritty yeah, perspective for pretty, sure. Pretty macho kind of. Yeah. yeah. So I, yeah, it was really interesting to, to read that type of you know, transition in real time. Um, it was during the pandemic, and she was. T what was really interesting is she um, took photos of herself and put them in a in an, an app that, kind of you know those apps that make change your appearance. Yeah, and it changed her, you know, appearance to to a woman, and she um, she it kind of I guess brought all these feelings that she was always that's always how she felt, and um, and so it was really interesting of how she um, dealt with all the issues around that, and really honest and realistic, and you know, um, self aware of kind of I guess she talks about the um, the benefit from having, you know, being a man in a writing kind of literary world and how that was her her whole life until she transitioned. And so it, it really touches on all the, um, on all the 
the topics that are very touchy uh, recently and in a, in a very human way. Oh, that's, that's so interesting. I had no idea. I'm like, I'm actually a big fan of that book and really, oh, yeah. 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 The, they also put out, um, I think the, at, 100 Center, at 100 Center Street, the old police station, when that was renovated into condos, they found a bunch of old glass plates of like evidence photos wow. and like they, put out a book of that at some point. They used to have it. I think I lost it years ago, but like almost like Ouija style, like crime scene photos. Oh, wow. That was really like of that same genre. Oh, like, wow. Yeah, that's so really cool. interesting. Yeah. But that's a great. Well, I super appreciate you taking the trek over in the rain to have a conversation. Um, I know God, it's been, it's been here. We've known each other for quite some time now, so it's, yeah. it's, it's cool. And I'm really excited to hear the new stuff. So is there any, uh, potential dates for that or just in the um, future no potential dates um it was recorded maybe two years ago in costa rica we, um, and that's where like rick rubin kind of um you know his vision that's kind of what he what he brought to our our kind of group was uh he had this vision of us playing outside in a tropical uh, <laughs> setting and um and it was kind of crazy. Um, it, we, yeah, he rented a house in um, in Costa Rica. I think it was Mel Gibson's house wow. um, that had kind of this platform that overlooked the ocean. I mean, it was really incredible. And we that's we basically recorded the entire and wrote the entire album outdoors. Uh, and just, that really uh, that obviously informed the vibe of the album. Definitely informed the vibe and just yeah, really really crazy setting and that actually that's where i was going surfing uh in uh during those times off i i got to get it back back in there all right well we'll get back out in the water soon until cool. then awesome cheers yeah thank you man thanks for listening and a huge thanks to today's guest for dropping in if you enjoyed this episode do us a favor and take a minute to rate review follow or subscribe this episode of The Plug contains original theme music by Andrew Van Weingarten and Dan Drohan. Mixing and sound design by Matt Boynton at Ultraviolet Audio. Logo and branding by Italic at italic-studio.com. And you can check out my photography at justinj.com. Thanks again, and be sure to check out the archive and tune in for future conversations. <laughs>